For this session, I'd like to introduce our distinguished panelists, starting with Anne Wu. Hello and welcome. You're a PhD student in computer science at Cornell University in New York, working in the intersections of natural language, machine learning, and computer vision. Uh, previously, Anne was a data scientist at BNP Paribas CIB, delivering AI and business intelligence solutions, and she also worked at, at Facebook AI Research on speech translation. It's truly a pleasure to have you for this panel. Hi, Julia. I'd also like to introduce Victor Sorsen. He's the VP uh, AIML lead at JP Morgan, uh, where uh, he works at the intersection of research and product development in explainable AI, fairness, and synthetic data generation. He previously worked also at BNP Paribas and Adobe. He is also a contributor for the review Le Grand Continent on topics like uh, geo the, the, the geopolitics of AI and tech policy. Hello and welcome to you. Hello. Thank you for having me. Uh, Jean-Louis Jean Keguiner, he's uh, worked in multiple industries from finance to advertisement real-time binding and in the last four years he's been working over at uh, OVH Cloud and he's been uh, specifically focusing on building data and AI products. Hello to you. Thanks for hosting me. And Leo Dreyfus Schmidt, after a PhD in pure mathematics, which is uh, pretty far from software and data, Leo joined Data IQ uh, at a crucial moment before the French young company made its entrance in the US market. Six years later, while well, Leo is now leading the ML research team at Data IQ uh, that seeks to develop tools to assist ML practitioners uh, on their data journey as well as contribute to the academic community. He's especially focusing on ML in the real world. And the current research topics include labeling and active learning, uh, but also data set shift, uh, detection and correction, robust ML, as well as causal interference. Hello as well to you, Leo. Hello. Hi. Thanks for having me. So there are indeed, right now, we are seeing the emergence of new paradigms uh, in the development of AI that are uh, emerging more and more. So the first question we have in this panel is first to ask the question of how exactly do these new paradigms affect companies? Uh, so I'd like to turn to uh, Jean-Louis first. How do we do we actually today need a lot of data to do AI? Um, okay, that's a very good question. Uh, to be honest, you don't need that much data. Uh, the, the size of the data doesn't really matter. What matters is the quality of, of the data. And the quality of uh, the data doesn't mean only the quality of the data itself is the data and the metadata. So what I mean by that is if you have a picture of, let's say, an imperfection on one of the items that you have in your factory, uh, the, of course, the picture is very important, but the metadata that you have with it is even more important, meaning the labels, but not only the labels, all the content that goes with it. So um, it might depend on the camera that's taking the picture. For instance, the quality of the camera can change, can affect the quality of the, uh, of the model you're going to develop. So... Um, Having big data doesn't mean a lot. Having qualitative data means a lot. And having qualitative metadata is even more important. And finally, having contextual data, meaning you need to be in the same context to have the uh, appropriate uh, models of AI to be, to be uh, pertinent. And in the end, uh, everything that you're doing uh, with those data can't be done uh, without the business people being involved. So I don't care that you have terabytes of data. What I care is that you have someone that knows the business that is sitting with you. The operator on the on the supply chain that has been trained to detect those defaults, uh, for instance, in a factory, is the most important key that you're going to have in your models. It's even more important than the terabyte of data you're going to have to train your models. So having a lot of data doesn't matter. Having qualitative data matters and people matters. Well, that's definitely a message we've been hearing uh, throughout the day. But uh, Leo, I'd like to turn to you. How is the focus actually split between uh, data and model? Yeah, so I think as John we say, it's also about who does what, and like it's, it's the focus is different on who's doing the job. So if you have that operator that John Louis was mentioning in the supply chain, then you know he has a specific job, and then they could be uh, after that the labeler, the annotator of the data. Uh, who will do a specific focus. And then when you bring that to the analyst, the data scientist, whatever you have, uh, they will bring in the analytics and the machine learning models that goes on top of that. So it's, it's I guess, not really spread through the journey of the, the data, but uh, I think definitely what we realize is the hype 
is AI, a lot of talk on AI, which is about models, the state of the art, the nice things that we see from the big technology company. But in reality, you do most of the job if you have a proper and robust way to collect the data, to clean it, to enrich it. As you, as you said with metadata. And then the, the kind of like the cherry on the cake, it actually do the proper machine learning model. But this is not where most of the game will usually be. Uh, you can get away with um, naive and almost stupid machine learning models and not the fancy ones if you have been careful enough to add the proper information prior to, to get to that stage. Now let's refer back to the first question that I asked in, uh, in the introduction of this panel. Uh, there are, you know, uh, what are some of the biggest mistakes perhaps that companies make in AI projects? Uh, uh, what lessons can be learned? And perhaps uh, if we take one example, there was a time where companies referred a lot to pox. Is it still the case today, Jean-Louis? Oh, yes. <laughs> pox everywhere. Uh, everyone gets pox. Uh, but the, the, the reality is that um, the common mistake I'm seeing uh, usually in, in companies is, uh, let's say, four things. Uh, the first thing is not focusing on value. Uh, that's the, 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 the number one key. There are a lot of companies doing some pox and doing some uh, machine learning and AI based on fancy uh, fancy use cases, while the real thing is if you want to, the, to to embrace the change, you need to focus on value. What is bringing value or what is removing some cost for the company? So I'm taking, for instance, uh, if you have an anti-fraud system, it's a very good use case. It doesn't have to be super fancy in terms of models. Uh, it has to have very good data, very good data laborer, very good data annotator. We go back to the quality of the data. You don't need a very a strong PhD uh, background or whatever. What you need is good data, good understanding of the business and good context and having value to make sure that the business in the end is able to under this use case and to give it a go for the product. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is explainability. Um, the business is seeing that as those AI system as black boxes and, and it's very difficult for the business to understand and to accept that there's going to be a change in the company where they, where they can't explain what's happening behind the scene. And that's one of the big focus that we still need to work on, uh, companies that are building AI products in, in general, to explain to the business people, to make them accept that this black box is not a black box. Uh, it's not fully explainable, but yet it's explainable. But you need you need to deal with it. It's making money. It's saving money. So just accept that it's like that. Okay, uh, that's the second element I'm seeing. Uh, the third element I, I'm seeing in those uh, issues or fail uh, the mistakes that the companies are making is they are uh, building some data centric uh, groups, some small group with data experts, and uh, without talking to the business people. So they are saying, oh, we're going to deal with this uh, this problem and they don't involve the business um, in, trans in a transversal way. And that's one of the biggest mistakes because all the engineering and all the uh, all the, the, the brain is in the people that are actually making the business run on a daily basis. And so if you don't do that, first thing, the business is not going to accept your solution. Uh, they're going to find find a way to say that you want to replace them, which is not the case. You try to do the thing right, but you didn't involve them, so it won't work. That's a purely organizational uh, element. And second thing, you are relying on pure um, mathematical uh, methods and, and things like that where the business is not able to understand what's behind the scene, what's the the, uh, the logic that is behind the scene. And that's very difficult. And honestly, having uh, maybe 100 uh, if statements in an algorithm sometimes worth better than having a very complicated uh, deep neural networks uh, that is uh, completely explainable, uh, difficult to explain for the business uh, while if statements are very understand, uh, easy to understand for the business and to accept. And you can improve that in the future. And finally, the, the fourth point, uh, in my opinion, is that uh, you don't set some uh, key uh, key performance indicator. I'm calling it KPI, or in in my teams, I call it uh, uh, condition sortie. So exit exit conditions. When you start a project, a AI project, you need to have exit conditions. You need to say at which point your product will be acceptable, because it's infinite. Okay, you can be 100%, uh, can have 100% accuracy. Okay, it's possible to do it. Just it's going to take you 1,000 years. So you need to define at which point this is good enough to go out uh, of this project and say, I'm done. This is the, uh, the the level of quality that we have green on and we need to move further. Otherwise, what's going to happen, your data science team is going to be working on one project 
one item and they're going to keep refining for years and years and years and never going to move to the next use case, it's going to cost millions. At the end, when, you want, when you're want, you going to save hundreds of uh, thousands, so there's going to be a big balance between the cost and the uh, and the value. And 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 plus, you're going to, you won't meet the expectations of the of the company or toward the AI transition. So um, exit conditions are probably one of the key mistakes that people are not taking into account when starting a project. Um, it's going to end up to and customer segmentation, and you're going to do that for years, customer segmentation, and never going to move to other use cases that are bringing a lot of money to the company. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's already lots of insight. Thank you for that. Now, uh, perhaps let's try to zoom in a little bit more into the technicality of this problem and how have these paradigm shifts actually affected ML ops? Um, Leo, you know, you're, you're definitely the person to turn to for this question. What is the current status of the adoption of ML ops in companies today? Uh, thank you. That's a good good question. Um, I guess you see a different level of maturity uh, because you see some people who are in a hurry to get to a machine learning part, as we said earlier, and then, then they realize that uh, the story is not over when you reach the production state. It's almost only the beginning. Uh, so it has we had that focus in the past years about like, oh, build machine learning models. It's all about the model itself. Now we see slowly people trying to understand. And as we said, again, uh, sometimes it's just better to have uh, another box, not a machine learning box. Maybe it's a simple if else statement, maybe it's uh, just an expert rule, uh, but that does the job. And then even, even if you only do that, when you go and push your model into production, then you start having an array of new uh, challenges you have to face, uh, how you maintain this, how you're going to make sure that uh, the quality of the data stay constant. It's somehow like a stationary problem, like a, never, things never are constant, things always change. So you, you, you might have done a great job at uh, collecting the data, analyzing, removing outliers, whatever you want to do, training the model, but then, you know, uh, data changes, the world changes, and so MLOps is just a, a framework for people to be aware of this, I guess, and try to discover all those new challenges. And so, it, and you see, this is also where you see that it's important to be uh, sometimes naive in your approach and make simple pipeline because debugging in production and machine learning pipeline is never fun, uh, and whenever it's live. So, if you have to deal with complicated and sophisticated uh, stuff, it's even uh, less fun. Uh, but like I said, I think we see a different level of maturity throughout uh, people we, we talk with. Uh, but definitely, this is where you have a wake up call like uh, machine learning and data is all fun and game. Why you just in the sandbox? Uh, it turns to a different story if you're trying to implement it for real and have it run live. Now, when we speak of AI, companies are definitely facing uh, several challenges, such as AI bias as well, but also imperfect labels. Uh, here, I'd like to turn perhaps to uh, Victor and to Anne. Uh, Victor, what are the main challenges uh, that we face when dealing with incomplete labels? Yes, thank you, Julia. Maybe just uh, quickly before uh, answering the question, I would like to bounce back uh, very quickly, like to discuss please, and maybe please, challenge please. a little bit the, 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 the new kind of paradigm between uh, data and models. Like, I completely agree that we've made uh, tremendous progress uh, to uh, really reduce uh, the, the, you know, the difficulty of access uh, to consume the models. And, you know, but models are not always uh, commodities. Uh, you know, today it's unclear uh, what uh, so that what state of the art is if you are looking for a compressed model, uh, which is behaving well for some uh, me uh, fairness metrics, uh, which is explainable, which is accurate. You know, if you want to do a computer vision, for example, without uh, using deep learning, and uh, you would prefer for some reason uh, using uh, graphical models, you know, and running, it, running those models on GPUs, uh, you can't use all those famous frameworks uh, which are drastically uh, facilitating uh, the way we consume models. Uh, um, so I think like to some extent, uh, for sure, like if uh, machine, if like deep learning and machine learning like is a synonym for, for, uh, for AI, of course, like models are uh, increasingly becoming uh, uh, commodities, but like we can find plenty of, of situations where uh, it is not the case. So, uh, and like, I'm happy to hear about like the other panelists, uh, what they think about that. Uh, to answer the, the, your question, so um, uh, on concrete use cases, uh, uh, when uh, we deal with incomplete labels, uh, first, maybe I would like to, uh, 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 
to 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 remind like some 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 facts very quickly. So uh, earlier this year, uh, there was like an MIT study uh, which uh, was quite popular, uh, showing that uh, among ten of the most uh, the most cited data sets, you have like something like three or four percent of the of the labels uh, which are um, corrupted. So I mean, you know. This phenomenon is not just happening like in some uh, very specific data sets uh, that you can collect uh, within some company, some industry, but really like it's also uh, impacting uh, like very mainstream, very, very popular data sets. And really like you don't want to overfit on, on corrupted labels, of course. Uh, uh, and so, so in like to be a bit more specific uh, in, the, in the financial uh, services, uh, we can face maybe two very concrete situations uh, where we face incomplete labels. Uh, first, uh, for example, for risk modeling uh, for credit, you know, uh, for the fair lending uh, teams. So uh, what you have basically is that you have two teams, one uh, modeling team and one uh, risk, one supervision team. And so the modeling team actually doesn't have access uh, to uh, the label for fairness, you know, so you have some protected attributes. Uh, some protected variables, for example, uh, age of people, uh, uh, sex of people, uh, and they don't have this information. And they are training uh, the model without this information. And then you have a supervision team which is in charge of, like, looking at the model and looking at, looking at like if the model uh, is uh, uh, achieving good uh, fairness uh, fairness results. So it's looking at, at, at bias. But you know, in that specific situation, like it's not even incomplete labels. It's just that you don't have uh, you don't have the labels and to make this kind of pipeline very effective uh, like most of the fairness framework uh, you know considering uh, protected attributes and doing some adversarial uh, learning on top of like your model uh, to remove the bias you just can't use those uh, fairness framework uh, which are like mainly derived from uh, from the from the academic world uh, so uh, I guess we will talk about challenges later, but one of the challenges really like the, 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 the gap between uh, industry and, and, and academia. Uh, maybe a second, uh, a second uh, use cases uh, when uh, we are dealing about uh, incomplete label, it's just like when we want to build uh, new data sets. You know, so you can face uh, incomplete or noisy labels uh, just because like humans uh, are noisy and also because ground truth is unclear. So we say like ground truth, you know, the, the, the ground truth labels, uh, very often you just don't know what to assign, you know. So of course, like humans are noisy uh, because we all have our representation of the world. Uh, we are all like kind of world models in a certain sense. And ground truth can be very often questionable. For example, uh, uh, some work, uh, uh, you know, which is like kind of constrained uh, by race or ethnicity categories. Uh, uh, those categories, I think, like in many ways, lack of nuance, uh, and you know, it's it's hard, like, really to 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 uh, to segment those those kind of of, of questions. Uh, yeah. So uh, I'd like to, at this point, to give also an opportunity to Anne to respond, perhaps, to the first part of this panel, uh, and then we'll also, you know, go a little bit deeper into the uh, the, imperfect the imperfections of, of labels, uh, and perhaps with this question, all are they all equal in the end? Thanks, Julia. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. And yeah, I would like to bounce back on something that um, Victor said previously. Uh, and well, before like moving to the data parts, maybe I would like just add uh, one perspective about um, the pipeline of machine learning. At first, our current approaches are actually like mostly involving improving benchmarks. Um, and we are mostly focused like uh, a lot on the model and algorithms parts, and especially like based on the supervised learning paradigm. This approach has, of course, its advantages. Uh, it allows like easier comparisons of models and uh, and so. Uh, but if there are already like flaws in the data, um, then it will necessarily like handicap all the efforts that we are doing. Um, at downstream levels, uh, including at the model and algorithms level, and. Um, for the data parts, I totally agree with uh, what the panelists uh, raised previously, that 
they are very um, objective dependent and uh, we have like intrinsic noises um, in the labels that, uh, that that's more like um, the nature of uh, the data rather than um, maybe something that um, can be can be dealt like um, and I think that this phenomenon uh, appear both in the academia and the industry as well. Uh, while in academia, uh, there's a lot of data that have been, for instance, collected and released uh, by crowdsourcing. And uh, I have been like investigating some of these data previously also. And there was, uh, as Victor said, like um, part of the data which are corrupted. And in industry, I think it's uh, even more complex uh, in the sense that the data are collected in the raw without um, instructions, for instance. Pre uh, those data are not pre um, prepared for the machine learning proposed at first, most of them. And uh, we also need like to uh, some sort of deal with them. There are like some common imperfections in those data that we can find, like for instance, the noises that have been raised about uh, incorrect labeling, which can be wrong, um, or they can also be partially wrong. For instance, when we annotate for a speech recognition data set, they can be spurious um, in the sense that they are right, but for the wrong reason. And I think that makes a lot of sense uh, what uh, I think Jean-Louis said previously about the importance of metadata in that sense. There are also like uh, a lot of uh, data that might be inconsistent because different conventions are taken by the annotators and there's intrinsically, um, as raised by, uh, by Victor, subjectivity due to human biases. And these are like hurting the performance like in, in all sense. And uh, they are also, I think, hurting the assessment parts in that if we already have flaws in our data, then the metric that uh, we rely on, they might not be that reliable and they might not be like showing the real performance that we want uh, on the real world. So um, I think there are, are like uh, several future challenges, like for instance, how to take into account these uh, imperfections when we want to train models uh, in practically. And also uh, another very important aspect I think is how to, how can we systematically improve the data quality um, like at the pipeline level and not only at the pre-processing level, for instance. Uh, I, I see that Jean-Louis is, is nodding his head. I was just wondering if, if you also wanted to add something at this point. Yes, there, there, are, there are solutions that uh, help you, uh, some, some neural networks, architecture, etc., that can help you to, to, to improve the quality or to improve the uh, the uh, cardinality of the number of, of data you, you, you have. Um, that are being trained on. So again, that's completely true. Like uh, quality of data is not only in the, the data processing, it's in the way you're designing your network, your algorithm, and the way you're handling all those uh, those parts uh, through the whole life of the data, not only the input. Uh, you're completely right. I was not thinking about that uh, until you mentioned it. It's uh, it's one key point. And, and it goes back to what was saying Leo before. Uh, it's not only the quality of data after the training, but you have to reassess the quality of data when you're in production. And this is what is called drift, uh, when your model can, can, can derive a lot with the reality. And if I take a good example, is a fraud system. I, I love fraud system, that's why I'm, I'm talking about that uh, all the time. But fraud is very adaptive system. Um, uh, when you have someone that is trying to fraud in a system, they're trying to get over the fence. Okay, and you put a new fence, a higher fence, they're going to try to find a new way to get over it. And this is a very good example where your data that was at the beginning and you're in, still in your database doesn't make any sense when you're in production and you need to reassess the quality. Even if you're uh, in production, you need to reassess the quality of, of the data from the past and readapt it. So it's a whole life cycle before yeah. training it, during the training, after the training, where, before retraining it, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a life cycle and the data and the data labeling should be something that is alive all the time, it should be reconsidered all the time. It's not something that is called once it's trained, once it's live. Well, thank you for underlining that important point as well. Uh, Victor, I was just wondering, what practical approaches would you say seem to be promising uh, to effectively overcome these, these incomplete labels today? Yes, no, that's uh, uh, a good question. So uh, first, I mean, there is really... Uh, 
like not a problem, but uh, we can improve on uh, bridging the gap between uh, academic and, and, and industry, you know, uh, on like the kind of general framework. So very often, uh, uh, how those methods that are coming from uh, academic, uh, how they scale in practice, uh, how they are like uh, overfitting to a very particular setting uh, is not... Uh, always good uh, for uh, um, like just taking those methods out, out of the box and using it in, in, in industry. Uh, more uh, specifically in, um, in financial services, like you have uh, some differences also between uh, banks and traditional financial institutions uh, and, and fintech, you know, because fintech uh, has to face less scrutiny, kind of less regulation regarding to, to data. And so like data is more manageable uh, for them than for us. Like something Jean-Louis said earlier about um, that, which, which is very true about uh, uh, data uh, coming from uh, the, the, the engineering team rather than from the business team. So it's, it's very true. And uh, in financial services, like I think something which is not well perceived uh, is that very often research teams uh, in industry are not in charge of uh, maintaining the, the data sets, you know? So their power uh, uh, to that, uh, uh, in that regard is quite limited. Uh, and so, uh, but we can, we can definitely do several things. Uh, for uh, data acquisition, uh, our power like uh, as uh, engineer, uh, uh, it's, it's quite uh, limited. You have some methods, uh, which are very interesting, like one, for example, uh, which is like confident, uh, confident learning, uh, learning, sorry, and actually uh, it has been used uh, in this uh, MIT uh, study that I uh, quoted earlier. So uh, you know, you 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 try to um, uh, to discover if you have uh, um, corrupted uh, corrupted uh, labels. So you know, at some point when you when you get a new data set, you just don't even know that you might have uh, corrupted labels, and maybe you want to uh, uh, to to put you in the loop uh, to to change uh, those labels. Uh, and so you have definitely you definitely have some uh, some techniques uh, from from research which uh, are working quite well actually. Uh, so human in the loop uh, is also uh, a promising uh, and efficient uh, approaches. Uh, you know, in AI, uh, often uh, when you want to fix AI, you put uh, you put human uh, human in the loop. Uh, you can. Uh, um, you can also leverage on uh, X and uh, Jean-Louis uh, uh, explained it already very, very uh, well. Uh, you can use external data, you can use synthetic data, you know, you can augment uh, your, your data set uh, to try uh, to use like also some heuristics and uh, um, you have full control on this synthetic data. So you have control on data production and as well as uh, label production. So this can be a fix too. Um, now, Anne, we just spoke a bit in the loop. I know that, uh, you know, one of the questions I have for you is, is how can we also learn perhaps with inputs from a human user or a teacher? Um, thanks. I, I think that's a really good question because um, beyond what we are actually uh, currently like focusing a lot on, which are improving um, the algorithms and the methods, uh, I, I think uh, we are also mainly relying on, for instance, collecting a fixed data set and then building the models and algorithms and then we do training. Um, after, uh, at the training stage, for instance, the human users, they don't really get involved uh, into that. And I think that's something that can be considered uh, of in like of integrating human in the loop for like several reasons. Um, um, one reason which is more like intrinsic to some tasks is that there's uh, intrinsically like some interactive nature uh, in those tasks. For instance, the communication aspect in natural language. And by taking into the, uh, account that aspect, uh, it, um, we are uh, ex expanding uh, the scope of our task. And on the other hand, I think that's more like related to real life deployment. Um, doing well on a benchmark doesn't necessarily guarantee that it will work well on our specific task. And this has been raised by uh, Victoria, by John Lee uh, previously. Um, so 
I think that it's quite important to learn from human feedbacks um, at the annotation stage uh, at, at, uh, at first, but also like throughout the, the training workflows and uh, learning from the feedback um, of experts. And most importantly, I think um, from the end users, which uh, um, at the companies, I guess that will be, um, for instance, the, the business entities sometimes. Um, and I think that we, we can actually like get a lot from the human users. Um, for instance, at the annotation stage, I have been working uh, on building a dead set previously. And um, the, at the design parts, I, I think there's already a lot of things that we can do to improve the annotation quality. Um, because when we want uh, to build a good dead set, uh, there, um, it involves like a lot of interactions with the annotators and in cross-sourcing data that um, are widely used, it's often not the case. Um, so I, I think like putting maybe more time and more communication uh, at, at first by uh, making like the instructions clear, by making um, also the scope clear, the objective clear is very important. And um, after in, in the workflow, if there can be like some um, sense of iterative back and forth between um, the users and also um, the engineers and the scientists who are working uh, on the models, that would definitely like be great to, to improve the model towards what we want to obtain at the end by combining like interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary expertise uh, in the academia and I guess uh, for a business that will be like combining um, different uh, expertise from different uh, entities, which I think uh, is not less challenging than uh, building like a better models at all. And I, I didn't have a, a chance to ask this question. I also have perhaps Victor's take on this as well, but I'd just like to go back a little bit on, on better training models. Uh, can we leverage additional information from the data to better train uh, models? Sure. Um, I think that like makes a lot of sense also like to, uh, because building data sets is expensive uh, to leverage or what we can obtain like from the data itself. And uh, I totally agree with Victor on um, the point that he has raised. Um, and there's uh, currently a, like also a lot of different approaches uh, which are trying to um, leverage information that um, are intrinsic to the data uh, and try to avoid uh, the to deal with the labels. So the, there are like uh, approaches su such as like self-supervised learning, which uh, is widely used, um, or also like more semi-supervised uh, learning uh, for instance, self-learning, where we can like train a teacher model on label data and then use it to annotate and label data in a synthetic way. And then we train that model by combining both. And it has been shown, for instance, in some uh, domains such as speech, that those different approaches can be combined to improve the performance um, of um, in, on our tasks. And in Academia, like there's also like a lot of investigation that has been done on using, for instance, auxiliary tasks, uh, for instance, in transfer learning, multitask learning, meta learning. Um, we can also like, for instance, leverage domain knowledge uh, when we design the models themselves. And um, just by designing like the different components according to what we want to uh, get uh, at the end. And of course, there's also like the data augmentation approaches um, that Victor described more in detail. Um, and I, I think like uh, by leveraging those additional information from the data, for instance, uh, to um, to do unsupervised pre-training, to pre-train a model uh, that on which we can obtain like good representation then this kind of models can be also like served to downstream tasks and um, used by different teams. Then for instance, that's something that's uh, being done like um, when I was working previously on some um, project like um, in, in my previous company. And I, I think there are like uh, di different approaches that uh, on which we should like maybe think also more about how to leverage those um, techniques um, that are being uh, actively like studied in research and put them effectively uh, into the pipeline um, at companies. Thank you. Now, briefly on this question, Victor. Yes, yeah, sure. No, so I completely 
agree with with Anne. So it has really to be a combination of many different techniques. You know, uh, again, self-supervised learning, meta learning, zero-shot learning, few-shot learning, and all those kind of techniques uh, which on which we can uh, leverage. Uh, I, I've seen very interesting work, um, like training a language model uh, uh, together with knowledge graph, uh, you know, to extract knowledge graph information, and then, uh, like, basically, uh, the, the research team was was really showing that the language model, uh, uh, if they are trained uh, in such a way, are uh, way more uh, robust to adversarial attacks, and they can, like, understand more uh, of the semantics content of the data. And so hybrid models are also, like, something uh, uh, really interesting interesting to look at and uh yeah in we we we, we do have like some techniques uh, also like in unsupervised learning uh where that that you you may want to leverage just maybe you know uh um when you don't have enough data uh you you would want uh, to speed up uh the the the, the process, the labeling process, so you can you can leverage on such techniques and active learning training, uh, active learning techniques uh, to uh, to 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 augment your data set or to to improve your data sets. Uh, now, Leo, I'd like to turn to you. What what guardrails, for instance, can be implemented to ensure a robust deployment? Uh, right. So, uh, as often, yeah, we we need full back full back mechanisms. Uh, whenever we do mesh learnings, I guess, as we talked uh, earlier, whether it is to deal with imperfect labels during the training or because this shifts uh, at a uh, running time. So how do you do that? You need four by million, you need to define those, you need to be uh, able to define scenarios under which you want to change your strategy. And th that's actually not that easy. One, one way to do this is called assertions. You could add an assertions to uh, how you want your models, your pipeline to behave in. Uh, if it start deviating from that, uh, prescribe uh, behavior uh, when you want to have an intervention. And this is where probably you get the human in the loop as well. Again, you want to have uh, someone when the robot fails to check upon the decision, to check upon uh, the, the labeling or anything that, that's come from your labeling pipelines. Uh, but then you need to decide how to make those assertions. They could come from like business knowledge. So I think this is where you can distill the expert knowledge even uh, in the production environment. You can also do that from the model itself uh, because all of those models and everything we've been talking about with imperfect uh, uh, labels, it's playing around with the notion of uncertainty. So it's a huge notion, of course, in machine learning and statistics, but this is also something you, you could leverage uh, which is kind of way to assess how you know how safe you want to be in deployment, how uncertain uh, you're allowing your, your model to be. And if you're not, then you ha can have that full by mechanism. And then basically, if you, you do machine learning, so we might as well do machine learning for machine learning. And this is where you can use machine learning to monitor your machine learning. So I know it's a bit meta, but uh, it's, it's actually lead to pretty interesting things. We've said a lot that uh, data can change. It's what we uh, refer to as being the shifts of the data. Uh, and, and it's true, so then you, can, you have to do a lot of decision. What can you do if you, you, if you get your data changes? Uh, first, you need to detect but the data has changed at the pattern. If you take the jean louis Severed example on fraud, maybe the fraudster has changed their behavior. They used to fraud in a certain way, and now this, they, they fraud in a, in a different way. So this is what we call concept drift. You're able to, to detect this. You're able to see like, oh, my model was really good at capturing this behavior, but the behavior itself has changed. So uh, it shouldn't be surprising that my model fails completely now. And it's a very complicated task to detect this and then to correct for it and then to be able to like apply correction. Uh, what should you do? Should you retrain from scratch? Probably you should get people relabeling the data because the fraud that was the 2020 fraud is not the 2021 fraud, for instance. Uh, so if you get the human in the loop uh, again. Uh, this is a field that we find very interesting. Like how can we put like tools which are machine learning tools to monitor over machine learning tools? Uh, and technically, uh, this is also called domain adaptation, uh, to be aware of, of, of changes of, of, uh, of data. Uh, so yeah, so I think that those, those, those will be some of guardrails we could do. Just to summarize, you need to define fallback mechanisms. You need to have human in the loop to check uh, when things go, go south. Uh, and you can also not only leverage human to, to check the behavior and to relabel, to re-annotate, things, but you can also leverage uh, machine learning to try to, to help you with that and take decision, which is maybe 
unplug uh, unplug your model and use uh, specific rules for slice of data. Maybe it's retrain the model, or maybe you can just trick the things a little bit with re-rating techniques or with other correction techniques. So those will be a way to try to apply guardrails to uh, DevOps and MLOps for machine learning. Well, that's a good way to wrap this uh, roundtable. We're almost coming to the end uh, of this discussion, but I'd like uh, uh, to also give a couple of minutes to Jean-Louis. I see that you were quite on the same page and I'm almost amused when uh, listening to Leo, so I'd like to, to have your comments. I think there's a technical difficulty with the sound. Um, He's on my side. Sorry. There you go. Uh, uh, yes, I think we, we all have the same problems. <laughs> We are all facing the same issues. Um, it's not that easy. It's easy to start from scratch. Um, it's very difficult to maintain it uh, on the long run. And people are underestimating, in general, the, uh, the, the production and the maintainability of those pipelines. Um, and, and again, it's, it's, um, it's difficult for, for, for everyone to, to, to have good models and to have a good production, etc. if they don't have the right data, because what one it's one of the big topics we were talking today, and um, and I have an advice for every company, <laughs> everyone trying to to get into the game. Uh, we have our own representation of the world, okay, and we have our own biases, and um, and it needs to be very clear from the start that uh, you have biases and you need to accept that. And you need to put everything in place to make sure that uh, along the way you are able to handle that from the beginning, the the collect of the data, the labeling, the pipelining, the drift of the model, etc. You need to accept that you have biases and you need to have like kind of a stickers on, <laughs> on your laptop saying, I have biases and I need to accept that and I need to make everything possible to avoid this. And uh, you have bases for locality of the data. Like in Germany, if I take self-driving cars, in France or Latin countries in general, if you want uh, to to have a car, are you going to save the, the kids that are crossing the roads with the red lights uh, and the grandma with, and, uh, that are crossing with red lights? Uh, are you going to um, die or leave them uh, and are you make the car die uh, with you in the car and save the kids? Or are you going to roll over the kids? Because they were not supposed to drive uh, to to cross the road uh, with the red lights, and guess what? There was an MIT study again that showed that depending on the countries and on the region of the world, the answer was not the same. They should have respect the law. They should die. <laughs> you should you should save the kids and the and the wives. You should die. And it depends on the culture. It depends on the locality. It depends on the context. It depends on so many things. So um, again, when you build a model. Data is the key, labeling is the key, metadata is the key, context is the key, and base is the key. The rest is just techniques, like machine learning is just math, and the math are the same for everyone. But the data and the labels are not the one for the same for everyone and depends on so many uh, contextual things that it should be your main focus and, and your main awareness along the, along the way. Well, thank you very much for that piece of advice. We are indeed coming to the end uh, of this panel discussion. It was a pleasure. Uh, thank you to Anne Wu, to Victor Storchan, to uh, Jean-Louis Keguiner and uh, Leo Dreyfus-Schmidt. It was a fascinating conversation. So thank you to all of you. Mm -hmm.